All right, so uh, I guess I'll introduce myself, or hopefully everyone here already knows me. I'm uh, John Petroselli. I do work in the department in computational phase imaging, and that's what I'll be talking about in my talk today. Um, so this will be a little different from a standard colloquium because I've had a few students recently talk about our phase imaging projects, um, and uh, Art Redgate will be giving a, uh, his oral qualifying exam in the upcoming months on our phase imaging projects. So there's going to be a lot of technical talks in detail from students. So I'll try to give a broad overview of what I do situated in the broader field of computational imaging and kind of define that. Then I'll talk about phase imaging in general and our uh, method of linearizing it uh, very briefly, not going into all the details the students uh, have and will. And then I'll just show some pretty pictures of our results um, to kind of highlight uh, what they're doing. So uh, broadly, I'm going to start from inverse problems in computational phase imaging or computational imaging in general and what is it, um, and then talk about what we do in particular. So when we teach or, or take a physics class, what we're usually interested in doing is taking some uh, forward model of a system, meaning we take some input to a system, and I'm interested in optical imaging, so I'm looking at trying to model the electric field as it propagates through some imaging system. So my input, in, in my case, is going to be an input optical or electric field. I'll call it X. It goes through some optical system here, um, which may include propagation through sp free space, interaction with different materials, Maxwell's equations governing all of that. Um, and that will be some system that I'll model at generally as this A operation. And then there will be an output, which in my case is what I measure on a camera in the lab um, and what I take and then process to get information out of it. And I'll call that output measurement a Y here. Um, so in the general framework of optical uh, uh, computational imaging, you would write your output here, the Y as a function of X, where the function is determined by knowledge of the physics of the optical system. So that'd be Maxwell's equations plus material properties plus the system engineering you put into it. Um, but what we do in computational imaging is we got to go in reverse from that. So this would be typically in a physics class, you'd be given your input, you'd be told the, the equations that govern everything. You do a calculation, you'd write down what the output is. Um, in the lab, we do the opposite. We measure the output. We have an unknown input. This field, in our case, it's interacted with some matter, and we want to reconstruct properties of the matter it's interacted with. So our target is to get this input field from the output measurement with knowledge of the equations that govern the optical system we're dealing with. So that's an inverse problem. And at least formally, you can write it down as if y is a function of x, where a is the system function, x would be a inverse of y. Um, the problem being that sometimes, indeed, generally for the problems we deal with, A is not easily invertible. You can't just compute the inverse of whatever function that is. It's usually some nasty combination of algebra, um, some differential equations, some integral equations involved there. Um, and in addition, we're dealing with the real world here, not a physics class where you're noise-free uh, propagating something forward through a system. We've measured the truth, but we've also measured noise on our camera just as a function of how they work. So when we go through this inverse operation, even if we can do it nicely and cleanly in one step, how do we handle inverting the noise and not reconstructing that as some material property of interest? So that's the general problem of, of computational imaging and inverse problems. So the most common way you'll see in the literature, there are many ways of tackling this inversion, but the most common way you'll see in the literature is to build something called a cost function and to use tools from a field of, of numerical optimization. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I'll kind of sketch how that works here and then lay what we do in the framework of it. So let's say we have a camera measuring the, the uh, field, and our camera happens to have only two pixels, pixel one and pixel two over here. Um, we can uh, guess values of the input field at those pixels, and based on the guess, we can run our physics class-based calculation and say, what is A of X? What output would we get for this particular input field? And then we can compute an error between what would come out of the system for our guess at an input field and what we actually measure Y at the output of the system. If they're not the same, that at each pixel there will be an error. When we take Y minus A of X at a pixel, that will be non-zero because it can go positive or negative. We square it. And then this is just saying sum the squared errors over all pixels to kind of distribute the errors over the whole camera. Um, so this is called an objective function. It's a single scalar value for the error on your camera system. Um, and the, the function might look something in our simple case like this, where the, the pixel value at the first pixel for the field is on this, this axis. The pixel value for the second pixel of the field is on this axis that we're guessing 
And the error from the true value we measure is this shape here, and there's a minimum over there. So the way you usually do this is you start from an initial guess. Maybe you have some assumptions on what it might look like. Or you just randomly guess an initial guess for the input field. You compute this error, and then you figure out, how do I decrease it? How do I update my two pixel values uh, of the field, the guess I'm making, to reduce this error? And it's usually a gradient descent type thing where you step downhill in this error function until you settle into a minimum. And then you say, uh, that's the best I can do. It's, it's similar, yeah. You're, you're minimizing some error metric. Um, we usually make it more complicated than this, but this is, this is initially how you do it, yeah. If you're assuming Gaussian noise, this is usually the optimal way to do it. Um, so, uh, so right, the, the idea is that when you reach this minimum, your guess will be optimal in the sense that it's predicting an output field that most closely matches the measurement you make. It gets around having to actually invert the function because you're just kind of updating something until your errors drop to the lowest value you can find. Um, the problems with it are that this is a simple sketch of it with one minimum. Often your problems have many local minima and you start from an initial guess that's near a non-optimal solution. You may converge to a local minima that has a lot of error and never get to the global minima unless you're really careful about how you do things. Um, noise can still be a problem because this measurement, the Y measurement has noise uh, embedded in it. And so when you take this difference, you're actually, and minimize it, you're fitting the noise in a sense. So you can overfit to the noise in this uh, scheme and it's computationally costly. If you're paying attention, this is a two dimensional optimization problem and I have two camera pixels and our, ca our cameras typically have tens of megapixels on them. So that's a tens of million dimensional optimization problem that I'm trying to do some gradient descent in. And there is a lot of work on how to do this quickly and opt optimize computational schemes to do this, but it is still very computationally costly to do it in high dimensions. And it's usually written, and you'll see this in the upcoming slides, this is the argument X that minimizes this objective function here um, that we're looking for, that minimization scheme. Um, so this kind of addresses your question, what do we do if we're converging to something that maybe, maybe we hit noise or maybe we're hitting a local minimum, we wanna make it behave better? Uh, we do something called regularization uh, generally in the field. So you add a function to this co cost function, this R, called the regularizer. And remember, you're trying to minimize this thing. So you add an R such that it's large for solutions you're going to want to avoid and small for solutions that you like. Um, how you define good and bad, what you like and what you don't like for solutions is an art as well as a science. So you try to build in prior knowledge of what you think might be a reasonable solution into this. And you try to do it in such a way that, that minimizing this thing, you can compute gradients, for example, of this R function. So it has to be smooth enough to do stuff like that. So it's, it's not trivial to come up with this. And usually the way it's cast in the problem is you add this function and then you add an extra term called the regularization parameter. And you can tune that to say, well, how strongly do I want to fit my data versus how strongly do I want to enforce prior knowledge about things? Um, so this is an example, just a top-down view of this plot from the prior one with the minimum right there at the center saying for this particular cooked up problem I have, the first pixel field value is three, the second is two, if all I'm doing is matching the measurement. But let's say I have prior knowledge that I really expect both pixels to have more or less the same value. So three and two are a bit different from each other. So I can add a regularizer that tries to force them to be similar. And as I make lambda stronger and stronger, you'll see that the optimal solution in dark blue here tends to be a line where the two are equal, and eventually you skew it to exactly that line. So there's a trade-off between how strong you enforce the prior knowledge and, and kind of ignore the data, and how much you bring in the data to get you to your solution. So there's a lot of study on methods to do this kind of in an optimal way. How do you pick lambda? How do you pick regularizers to do this? How do you make it all computationally efficient to do? I'm not gonna go too much deeper to that uh, in what I'm gonna talk about today, but that kind of sets the groundwork. And I'll talk about regularization later on with how we handle noise in our systems. Um, so that's kind of computational imaging broadly. Um, so now I want to go into propagation-based phase imaging a little more deeply, our particular corner of the, the computational imaging world. And then I'll focus in at the end of this on the particular models we use and show some results from our systems. So propagation-based phase imaging, we have specific systems and specific inputs and things we measure now. 
So I'm going to assume we're sending in a monochromatic input field. We can break that a bit later on, but it allows the math to be written down nice and simple and it's an easy way to understand things. So I have one frequency of a field coming in and I'm gonna be assuming I'm dealing with visible light or x-rays, which is where I, where I work. So in visible light, you're dealing with hundreds of terahertz as the oscillation rate field coming in, um, which is much faster than any imaging detector operates at. Our, our best detectors in the lab to get images, we're typically doing millisecond exposures. You can get down maybe to nanosecond exposures with imaging cameras if you have a lot of photons, but this field oscillates way faster than that. And that will be important in a second. So we have a monochromatic field coming in. The model of my system, I'm just gonna assume is nice and simple. It's a field going through free space. Um, no system optics or anything else. Shane's actually been working on and incorporating the optics of a microscope, but I'm going to, to not go into details of that here and steal his thunder. So uh, the end uh, measurement we make is just an intensity measurement at the camera. An intensity measurement is really a measurement of energy being deposited at every pixel on the detector in the integration time, milliseconds to seconds, um, that we're actually turning the sensor on and capturing a signal. So uh, if we neglect polarization, because nothing I work on worries about the polarization for, for this, this type of work, um, you can model your electric field as a scalar, just drop the vector nature of the electric field. And you can write it down if it's monochromatic in this form. Um, so this is the oscillation in time, the angular frequency omega, telling you about the color of the, the photons if we're dealing with visible light coming in. This is the amplitude or the, the oscillation strength of the electric field as it comes in. And this term here is the phase. That's the thing we're going to want to get out. That tells you about where the peaks and troughs of the, the wave are, are positioned at certain reference times and positions in space. So where do the peaks and troughs start from, for example? Um, if you take this as the electric field, assume you're in free space, go into Maxwell's equations, compute the pointing vector, and then time average it over many oscillations, because remember, we're oscillating many orders of magnitude faster than our detector can catch, so we're averaging many oscillations. Um, you can prove at the end of the day that your intensity measurement of the camera pixel is proportional to the modulus square of the, the electric field, or rather, I should say, the energy measurement at a detector pixel is proportional to. We call that uh, modulus squared of the, the complex representation of the field here, the squared, the intensity of the field, which is proportional to the energy. We're ignoring terms, the epsilon naught, mu naught, the refractive index that come out of Maxwell's equations, but we're also ignoring terms that have to do with the efficiency of our detector, the analog to digital conversion going on, converting it to integer values that our computer reads out. Um, it turns out we don't need to worry about the absolute value of this thing in relation to the energy being deposited. It's the relative values that matter, and those are captured by this. Um, we also, in addition to this, we know the physics that governs this free space propagation, that A I talked about before. It's a differential equation. This is called the paraxial wave equation. Don't stress about the math if you haven't seen this before. This is telling you if you have a field going down one axis, like a laser beam here, mostly going that way, we'll call the main axis the z-axis. Slight changes of the field along Z can be calculated by the way the complex field changes in the X and Y direction. This is the Laplacian in the X, Y play. Yep. Um, because if you, if you look at this carefully, it looks a lot like the Schrodinger equation. I'm not gonna draw analogies in this. I borrowed this from another talk where I go into some of the analogies between the two. Um, you may see that what I'm going to get into in a second looks like Bohmian mechanics, if you're familiar with that, but I'm not going to go deep into that here. Um, so K, as it appears here, is 2 pi over the wavelength. That plays the role of H bar, and, and depending on how big things are compared to that scale, you can get away with rays versus waves, basically. You'll see it in a second. Bohmian mechanics actually comes from these three being recast, but I, I will have a slide exactly on that in a second. Um, so graphically, that was a dump, dump of math on those slides. Graphically, what's happening is you have your waves coming in here. The amplitude is the square root of I, the height of them at two detector pixels. The phase delay is where are the peaks relative to each other, which has encoded information about how fast these waves pass through the material they're passing through. When they hit the detector, though, they hit it so fast, we can't see the actual oscillations and we lose information about the relative positions of the peaks. We only capture the intensity. Um, so the statement of our problem, if we go into a computational imaging framework, this is the field uh, uh, description that we have that we're trying to reconstruct. 
This is the measurement we make, the modulus square of it, which actually wipes out that phase term. And this is the physical law that tells us how our system operates in the forward model sense. Usually we compute uh, U propagating from that. So if you go to the computational imaging framework, you would cast it as something like this. Say I take one or more intensity measurements at different Z positions down the axis, different propagation planes. Uh, I would guess an initial phase and from the initial plane at Z equals zero, I would use that equation to propagate my field to each of my measurement planes. I would compute the some of the squared errors in each one, add them all up, and that would give me a total error of my initial guess. And then I would do some gradient technique or some error reduction technique to kind of find the optimal starting phase that would match my measurements as best as possible in all of those planes. Uh, the problem is that even if you do that scheme to kind of optimize by gradient descent, this this nonlinearity here is a big problem. It becomes a nonlinear equation you're trying to solve with this, which means it has many local minima when you tend to try to solve it. You get caught in those unless you heavily oversample your data, take many, 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 many measurements to constrain things. Um, the noise can also be amplified because it's a nonlinear system in unpredictable ways. Um, so it's not ideal, and a lot of people, th there are groups doing this technique, but a lot of groups try to get around it, including ours by simplifying things to linearize the equations to get around some of these nonlinear problems. And this often, in our cases, we can get away with single step inversion, although you can also do these iterative techniques. So this is the summary of where we were, and this is your, to come back to the Bohmian mechanics, this is what you can also uh, get from these equations. So if you take your complex representation of your field, plug it into this paraxial wave equation, you get a, yep, Yeah, if we set z equals zero there, that would be u in the initial plane. Yeah. I thought the whole point was to learn something about the medium. So I'll get to that in. So this this is the non-standard uh, uh, colloquium talk here. Um, I will get to the two particular applications we work on and how the information is encoded. But the short answer is invisible light imaging. It tells you about the the thickness of the material you're looking at in X-ray imaging. It also does, but the main purpose of it there is to boost the contrast over uh, attenuation or absorption, which also tells you about the thickness. Um, so I'll, I'll get to the two exact models for how it encodes in the phase, but it's a delay through, uh, of the material um, that you went through. And it turns out the two different wavelength regimes have two slightly different reasons for, for doing it. Um, but uh, so coming to the equations you get out of this, if you plug this first equation into the second one, separate out the real and imaginary parts, you get a pair of coupled nonlinear differential equations. Um, if you look at what they mean, so this is a propagated field from a two slit experiment. Uh, if you model it with rays, you can see what these equations uh, are kind of telling you. So uh, what I like to say is these equations kind of predict the wave nature, but I don't get a lot of intuition just by staring at the wave mechanics of this. I can't see where this comes from. But the ray equations give me a lot more intuitive sense of what's going on. You can interpret these second equations much easier using the ray framework. So this first one here ends up telling you that the intensity, if you move a tiny step down the main axis, which is vertical in this case for this system, um, the intensity at any point changes, and it changes according to the ray tracing down the axis. So rays are little bundles of intensity. They're essentially carrying the pointing vector down the axis, giving you information about that. So their direction, tells you how the intensity changes on the next step you take down the axis. And that's what this first equation tells us. And it turns out that if you work out the details, it's this gradient of the phase in the transverse direction divided by the wave number that actually tells you about the tilt of the rays um, transverse to the, the main axis of propagation. Uh, if you go to the second equation here, this tells you that these rays aren't actually straight lines. This is assuming they're straight lines with one tilt. It tells you the rays actually interact and, and interact with each other so that they never cross. This particular term here tells you that when the intensity varies rapidly, the rays kind of repel each other. So if you try to focus them, they'll actually just curve towards each other and head away. You can see them doing that down the center here. Um, in quantum mechanics, that's a quantum potential term. Um, so that gives you the wave mechanics. But for us, if we just take a small step and we stay away from areas where the intensity varies too rapidly, such as a, a, a focal region, um, we can get away with just using the first equation to a very good approximation. And that's what we do. So once you've uh, 
constrain yourself to only using this first equation. Um, it's, it's known as the transportive intensity equation originally derived in the 80s. Um, this equation, if you look at it, intensity is measurable. Di dz is measurable if you take two closely spaced intensities down the axis. This guy could be the initial intensity or an intensity right between the two. Um, the only unknown in this equation is the phase, and this is the linear equation then relating phase to measured intensities. And, and wave number just depends on the wavelength, which you know. Usually we measure, it depends on, on which experiment we're doing, X-ray or visible light. In visible light, we measure it at two planes and then one in the middle, um, two planes, one in the middle. Uh, in X-rays, we actually can't do that, and I'll get into the problems to why we can't take multiple planes. We have to do one plane, so we have to get around it somehow. So we have to come up with cleverer systems. So the visible light will be much more brute force application of this. The X-ray version of this requires making additional assumptions or modifying the system to allow you to get around it. Um, but I will get into all those details if I have time. Um, so how do you get this, this answer to the question of how we do this in visible light? Um, so how do you do this if you literally just solve the equation? This is a uh, spoke resolution target that we, we actually put in an optical microscope. This is uh, the intensity changing down the axis. So we go to the, the in-focus position where you can barely see it because it's just uh, etched into a depth of plastic. Uh, uh, you go on either side of focus, a small amount, five microns in this case. And I'll talk later about how we pick that distance. Uh, you subtract these to estimate by finite differences the intensity difference. You plug in the in-focus intensity in the center for, for that one on the right-hand side. That helps stabilize things, although you could plug in either one of these and it still re works reasonably well. Then this is a second order elliptic partial differential equation, which is unique up to boundary conditions. You can solve it by any method you want, iterative methods, uh, uh, finite elements. We use Fourier transform based methods, which uh, I won't go into details of here, but Shane did a very in-depth explanation in his uh, seminar talk about this. You, you solve this and you get a phase result out for this target. Um, so. One other thing I want to mention that will come up in, in particular in the visible light microscope version of this is how we handle noise. Um, so the signal is, or the TI is telling us that the signal, the change of intensity down the axis depends on the derivative of the phase. Because it depends on the derivative of the phase, that means it's sensitive to changes in the phase. The more rapidly phase changes, the stronger signal of intensity variation down the axis we're going to measure. So this is just a simulation of three Gaussians in phase of maximum two pi radians each of different sizes. So the little one changes the most rapidly, the big one changes the least rapidly. And as we defocus to two equally spaced planes on either side of the focal plane where you can't see anything because it's just a phase object, no absorption, you see the small one because of this derivative is the strongest, shows up the strongest in intensity variations, the big one shows up very weakly. And so that means if we have smooth features, large scale smooth features in the object we're trying to image, we get very weak measurements of it when we move our detector to try to capture it. And I'm not gonna go into the exact mechanics of how we solve it, but in doing the inverse problem, it means your inversion is looking specifically at these uh, slowly varying large scale features and saying, hey, I see something very weak there but I know it's supposed to be weak because I'll get a weak measurement. I better really amplify that in my reconstruction to get it correct. Uh, and that's, that presents a noise problem because if you have white noise on your detector, there are large scale, slowly varying features within that noise that are going to be specifically picked out and amplified by whatever solution technique you use for this equation, just by uh, the form of the equation. And that's where regularization com comes in for us. So we use a form of regularization called Tikhonov regularization which effectively picks a certain scale feature in the reconstruction and says everything bigger and smoother than this don't really reconstruct. Anything sharper and smaller than this, go ahead and reconstruct it. The reason we use that is it's fairly agnostic to the sample you're using, so we don't have to put in a lot of prior information favoring particular samples, although you could cook up something fancier if you wanted to. And more importantly, if we're solving this in a single step with Fourier transforms, you can implement this. There are very few regularization methods you can do in single step without having to go to an iterative framework. And we've found that as long as, as, as uh, we don't make strong assumptions favoring particular samples, all the denoising methods we work use work pretty similarly. So we just go with this one uh, generally, unless we have a better reason not to. So this is increasing the regularization parameter. You can see those large scale features are removed. 
And in this case, it works quite well because our spoke target has very fine features and we can remove the noise and see those nice and clearly. You'll see in the results I show that's not always the case. And we have to worry about that sometimes, removing sample structure. All right, so I'll move on to the first of our two applications, which is visible light phase microscopy. Um, so the, the target here is that cells are mostly water. So they're transparent. If you put them under a bright field microscope and try to image live cells, you see something like this where you don't get a lot of information out. Yep. The the big ones versus the small ones, or, or what? So this would be, this, this is a phase object. You could think of these like three lenses of different sizes. And the smallest, most sharply curved lens is going to focus light the quickest, right? If you have a really strongly curved lens, you'll get a strong focus. If you have a really shallowly curved lens, you get a very weak focus. This is the intensity. The lenses were placed here, and this is the intensity we measure. So the, the sharpest one focuses the most. Is that get it? What? Uh, not, not in this case. So this case is just saying if our object we often don't get to choose the object we're looking at. We have the, the cell, for example, that we're trying to image. Um, it has the features it has. So what I'm saying here is if the cell looks more like this guy, it's going to be very hard to see, and it may be buried in the noise, and we may need to distinguish it from a bunch of background, which is pure noise, just from the camera measurement that looks like blobs. So if my cell looks like this blob, I'm going to have to figure out a way to tell it apart from noise. That's what I was getting at there. So you'll see, I'll have some images of actual cells that we're reconstructing in the upcoming slides. If that will, we can come back to it. You can't in some cases. In some cases, this measurement is going to be so weak that it gets absolutely buried in the noise in your camera. And then there is, unless you throw a huge prior assumption in that there is a cell here and kind of brute force it to reconstruct the cell, which may not be a valid way to do things anyway. Um, eventually your signal just falls below the noise and there's no real way to disentangle them. Some people would argue that they have a particular scheme that'll do this, but usually if your noise gets, your, your signal gets too buried in the noise, eventually there's no hope of getting it out. So there will be things that are so weak and the noise is so strong in your measurement that you have no hope of getting them. I'm not going to get into it in this talk. Shane has actually done some work looking at, at this and picking optimum regularizations to try to get around this. Yeah, with the images I'm going to show, we have enough signal and low enough noise that we can actually see them. Um, but I'll, I'll actually show some results where regularization impacts things. So we do get need to throw out some background noise, and we have to deal with that because it impacts the measurement we're trying to make. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. This isn't magic. If you have too noisy a measurement, you're not going to be able to get anything out of it. Um, when when giving, giving talks, we always show the data where we have enough signal to noise that we get pretty pictures out. But I could show you plenty where you can't see anything. Um, uh, so cells, in a bright field microscope, your cells look like this. And the usual way of getting around this is to stain them, um, make nice, pretty pictures under a fluorescence microscope. But the problem is, that if you're trying to image a dynamic process and you don't want to interfere with the life cycle of the cell, staining will, at, at the very least, uh, uh, affect your cell's behavior somehow and quite often kill it. Um, so this, these label-free, so-called label-free techniques that just allow cells to live, live while you take images of them uh, have a lot of applications in studying dynamic, dynamic processes, and that's kind of where phase imaging falls in, in biological imaging. So we're going to look particularly at quantitative phase imaging, which is getting a number out for phase. And our application is measuring cell volume with this. Um, but quantitative phase imaging in general, this is where, coming back to Vivek, your, your question about how information is encoded. So in visible light, it's as the light passes through your microscope slide with a cell on it and the cell is sitting in some background medium, 
the difference of phase velocity in the two mediums times the thickness of what it passed through tells you about the delay of the wave at every point, um, the, the thickness of the cell that it passed through. So if you know what the cell's refractive index is approximately, and, and we have models for that, you know what the medium is, you can measure that. You can estimate what the thickness of the cell is at every pixel you measure by measuring the phase. Um, and invisible light absorption is often negligible. So it's not really all that coupled to phase, at least it's the one wavelength you're, you're looking at it. Uh, you just don't get much from it. So uh, just broadly, what are some applications of this? this is not all our work, um, but the early, early results of quantitative phase imaging, we're looking at nanoscale dynamics of red blood cells. Uh, people have looked at uh, live neurons during activation to get thickness profiles across them. Um, this has applications in measuring cell volume and mass. So this was an early study of measuring how cell growth changes the volume of cells. Um, we are looking at, and this is what I'll show results for, cell death, volume changes on cell death. Um, you can use it to study disease processes. So this is an example of a cell infected by, by malaria, and you can track how it changes in real time without have, interfering with the disease process. And it, it has uh, applications also if you're trying to, to study the impact of drugs on cells. So this was a study of cancer uh, drugs and seeing how they killed cells. And you can study them without interfering aside from the drug with the behavior of the cells by using quantitative phase imaging. And this is just a half hour web search for recent applications. So there's many, many papers out there, people using this for different biological applications, wherever you need kind of a thickness profile of cells. So our particular study is, is to look at how methamphetamine kills brain cells by studying volume changes. Um, we're looking at neuron cells in, in particular, we're looking at rat, rat uh, brain cells. Uh, in, in what I'll show, undergoing meth-induced apoptosis, which is a form of programmed cell death. Um, uh, for this talk, I'm not going to go into the biology very much, but it's, it's the body's way to kill cells in a controlled way. So you can see a rat uh, cell undergoing uh, apoptosis here, where it, something goes wrong with cell division, so it packs up all the nuclear material and then uh, dies there at the end and kind of explodes. Um, so this is associated with volumetric changes. So what we've been doing is trying to measure volume changes on uh, cell death. Uh, because TI is kind of a new technique and the, the noise question, how it handles low frequency noise can impact the results. It's not a particularly well-established technique outside of specialized labs that are studying it. So we wanted to compare it to a gold standard technique that you can buy commercial systems for that's very well calibrated. Um, so we've been comparing it with a digital holographic microscopy system in uh, Alex's lab. So the digital holographic microscopy system, I'm not going to get into too much because it's just a reference for, for what I'm talking about. But uh, the, the particular imp implementation we used separates the beam into two paths with a beam splitter, passes one beam, uh, this is the laser beam, through the sample, passes another beam uh, through space without a sample, recombines them at a sensor, because it's the same beam being recombined and it's coherent, it forms interference fringes. And if the sample induced some phase delay, the interference fringes are, are shifted around based on the phase delay. And by analyzing the shifts of the interference fringes, you can infer what the phase induced by the sample was. Um, so we're gonna use that as comparison to TIE and that's gonna be the result we trust because we very well understand how the system works and the errors involved in that system. Um, so why use TI if you have another system that does the same thing that is a gold standard technique? Uh, and there are a few drawbacks to DHM that, that someone might want to select the propagation-based TIE technique instead. Uh, one is that, that DHM uh, has to use fairly coherent sources. We're using a laser, so it suffers from coherent noise. The light can interfere with itself too well, and you can get this speckly pattern. You can also get diffraction fringes, wave effects off of every element you happen to hit in your optical system. Um, the resolution limit is limited to the coherent diffraction limit, which is in theory half of what we can do with TIE. I'll, I'll talk about that in detail later on when I come back to TIE in our microscope. Alignment can be difficult. You need you don't need this setup necessarily, but you need specialized optics to do interferometry. You have to maintain alignment to the beams while you're doing your measurement, at least to within a fraction of a wavelength so the fringes don't shift too much and wash out. Um, and you have to watch out, therefore, for vibrations and airflow. We've seen some of that in our measurements uh, in comparing these systems. And you have to do additional phase processing in the form of phase unwrapping because your fringes are sinusoidal, so you only know peaks modulo 2 pi radians in phase. So if you have more than a 2 pi phase change, you have to do an extra computational step to unwrap them, which can be problematic if you have noise on your sensor. It's not necessarily trivial. So all of this, in particular, the alignment and the, the fact that you need extra optics for the system may make DHM not necessarily 
something you can just drop into a biology lab who wants to do measurements of live cells. It's not compatible with their standard bright field microscope techniques they do, and they may not have the necessary optical engineering expertise to, to align and maintain the system. So the advantages of TIE above this are you literally just take your regular microscope and move the camera. So you need an extra motion control stage, but that's about it in your system. Um, you can get away with partially coherent illumination, in fact, very low coherence, which, which really means you can use even white light in some cases, just a standard microscope. Um, we use LEDs because it makes the results a little better, but you don't need the monochromatic nature of lasers to do this. You don't need spatial coherence. So again, LEDs, white light instead of lasers can work for this. Um, you don't tend to have a lot of coherent noise and artifacts because of that. Yep. What's the time scale moving the camera up down? I can refer that to Shane as to what he had these days. I can tell you what I what I used to get for it, but I think he's faster than me now. And if you're not mechanically moving a stage, there are groups who have these tunable electro optical lenses that you can just just tune. They they can take it very fast, less than a second to take images. Okay, for us, we're interested in minutes, but some people, depending on what you're looking at, you may care about much shorter timescales than that. So you would, you would target your particular way of doing this to the timescales. Some people even use, you could put a beam splitter here and have cameras at two different positions to take simultaneous measurements and do real time. And some groups do that if they need something very quick. Um, we don't care that much, so we're not so focused on speeding it up. Good question. Um, so the resolution limit for this partially coherent light can double, in theory, what you can get with this, um, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, it's relatively simple and, e and cheap um, and easy to implement for biology labs, you, standard illumination, no need for an interferometer. Less sensitive to misalignment, you really only have to maintain alignment between your measurements to one pixel, which are typically microns, several microns to tens of microns in size compared to DHM, which over the course of your measurement has to be fraction of a wavelength, uh, which is hundreds of nanometers. And it's computationally easy to implement. Once we've written the code for this, you just put in two images or three images into the code, it pops out a result, no iteration needed, no phase unwrapping needed. Uh, so our experimental setup to do the simultaneous measurements with both has two systems in one, um, and Shane showed this in his talk, so I'll go through it quickly. Here's our interferometer for our helium, uh, uh, sorry, our, our digital holographic microscope, the helium neon laser is our light source. The beam splitter splitting it into two beams. This comes through the sample here. This is the reference beam not passing through the sample. They're recombined and output from the microscope down here. At the same time, we have LED illumination for our TIE system. I'll talk more about that in the next couple of slides. That illuminates the sample, and that just goes through the microscope. All of this is standard microscope optics with the exception of the beam splitter that only has to be there for the DHM system. So TI would work with just the regular microscope. When we come out, we add some additional lenses just to take the field and copy it a little further along so that we can insert both cameras. We can't just slap them on the output of the microscope. There's not enough space. Yeah. We are not concerned about aberrations here. Um, so, so part of that is we're using high quality microscope optics for the most part here. And I think even the 4F system is fairly high quality uh, achromatic doublets. If, if I recall what we had used to assemble it, Shane, you can correct me if we were using those still. Okay. Um, so we, we do try to tamp down aberrations as much as possible. Uh, Shane is actually working on extensions to this technique, which incorporate, TIE does not incorporate the pupil function of the microscope. It's assuming free space propagation, so it's, it's ignoring all of that. Shane's actually working on uh, uh, methods that incorporate the pupil function you can put all your aberrations into if you've measured them and perhaps get better results. But, but they're not too bad for the quality of the optics we have that they're impacting things. Um, Okay, so when we come out, both beams are on top of each other. We got to disentangle the red DHM uh, uh, laser beam from the blue LED illumination we're using. So we use a dichroic mirror, which is a, a multi-layer thin film device that reflects about 100%, close to 100% of the red, and is designed to transmit close to 100% of the blue. Because the laser is so much more powerful than LEDs, 
a little bit of the laser leaks through here. So we put an additional filter to filter out the, the red laser uh, illumination there. The DHM camera just captures the interference pattern, which we process and get phased from. The TIE camera, we can move down the axis on a motion stage to capture our multiple intensity, three intensity measurements in our case. So uh, in terms of how we do the sources, I said you could use a standard microscope illumination, and we have in the past. But uh, because we want to boost the resolution we're, and get more light, we're using a programmable LED array. So this allows us to change the shape of the pattern uh, with a bunch of little LEDs that we can program how they, how they appear um, during our measurement. And this is just scanning through a bunch of different patterns. We pick one pattern to do all our measurements with. We don't scan them as we're taking measurements. Um, so if you go through the theory, something I worked out with my first student here, if you go through the theory, as you defocus, your defocused images actually blur, and they blur with a function that looks like this. It's a scaled version of the shape you're projecting up here as you go. Um, if you know anything about blurring, if you blur a signal, you lose some information about it. It's very hard to retrieve it. So the ideal case, if you don't want to lose any information, is just turn on the central LED, one point. You don't blur your signal. You get the best signal possible out. Um, but that's dimmer than this, so you may get more noise just from having less photons. And in addition, using these larger annuli can have uh, benefits for the resolution of the system. The, the annuli are kind of almost optimal in the sense that at least in the radial direction, they blur minimally. Um, but they have a big impact on resolution. And, and a way of seeing that is here. So I've mentioned resolution for partial coherence a couple times. When you illuminate a sample straight down the optical axis, as in with a laser beam, the resolution, the spatial resolution that you can resolve on the sample, the transverse resolution uh, horizontally on the sample, uh, is determined by the range of scattering angles you can capture from the light that went into the sample versus what went out. And that's defined by what's called the numerical aperture of the objective, or NA of the objective. So you send something straight down the axis, there's an angular cone that you can actually capture. The size of the cone bigger means you can see smaller things. Um, so there's a maximum, if you go down the axis, that's called coherent, a maximum coherent scattering you can capture that, that limits your resolution. If you illuminate from off axis, you get no scattering in this direction because you can't go any further and still be captured by the objective. But you get twice the scattering in this direction. So if you illuminate from the opposite side, you get no scattering this way, but twice the scattering this way. If you illuminate from a whole annulus, you actually capture twice the amount of scattering information from all directions than you would in the coherent case. And so that's why I keep claiming you can double the resolution uh, with partially coherent illumination. It's the angular capture you get. It's a good, so, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have, you, you can double the performance of your system. You can make the feature size you can see smallest. There are, are multiple ways the term resolution is used. To be technically correct, you can have the spatial resolution of your system. You can double the performance of your system. Um, yeah, yeah. We do better. <laughs> um, yeah. Our system, good. Um, so the the... So we, we illuminate from something, an LED pattern that's matched to the numerical aperture here so that we could double the resolution. Um, there's also the fact that we are blurring, though, and that actually increases the noise because we're blurring information as we go out of focus with the shape of the annulus. So you have two competing things. You have this, this, this improvement in spatial resolution fighting an increase in noise. Um, we're also not modeling, to come back to that question, aberration in pupil function here, which would come into play if you really wanted to model this. Um, so we don't do quite as well as doubling. We find that if we match half the angle that can be collected by the, the objective, that about optimized our system for all the parameters we're dealing with. Uh, the reason we use a programmable LED array is if you ever used a microscope, you switch magnifications, you switch the numerical aperture of your objectives. And so you want to have the ability to switch this annulus. If you want to do that dynamically without having to mechanically switch things in and out of your system, you want something programmable. Yep. Yes, we haven't studied that. So, so that's something 
We haven't studied that recently. That's something Tanmoy was looking into when I first started here, was how we can optimize if you have <clears throat> a certain time budget to take your measurement, how would you optimize by, he actually combined measurements with multiple sources. How would you do that to optimize your SNR in what you got out? Um, we haven't looked at it in this system because, again, the time scales of things we're looking at aren't really limiting us. We're not limited by the number of photons at a time we can collect. Um, but but that is something you could consider here, shapes to, to kind of maximize. Yep. Um, so in terms of the defocus optimization, we go, uh, it turns out the defocus, the further you go, the easier it is to see these changes of intensity. But if you go too far, you break that, that assumption that only one of the two uh, Bohmian mechanics equations came in, and you have to worry about nonlinear effects coming in. So you have to stay small enough that, that you're linear, but go as big as possible so that you can see things as clearly as possible, the intensity changes as clearly as possible. About the distance you want to go to kind of kind of optimize things is the Rayleigh range, which is how far you can go before these nonlinear effects tend to kick in. Um, so that's about, for us, uh, if we calculate a wavelength of the numerical aperture squared, or 7.5 microns if we defocus our stage. Uh, if we defocus our camera, because we have 10x uh, magnification, we get a 10 squared factor that we can go further with the camera at the output of the microscope. So we get uh, about a millimeter of total uh, defocus range on both sides of focus. So our, our live cell imaging um, pipeline goes something like this. When we apply it to measure volume changes in live cells, we take the simultaneous measurements with both systems. We match the field of view. We get reconstructions for them here. Rather than imaging phase, because phase, if you think all the way back to the definition, it had a lambda in the definition of it. We're using red and blue photons, so our phase is going to automatically be different, even if everything else, refractive index and everything is the same. We want to back that out, so we multiply phase by lambda over 2 pi, which removes the lambda dependence of the phase, and get something called optical path length, which is just thickness times the difference in refractive index between the cell and the medium it's sitting in in the background. So it gives you a thickness measurement, essentially, uh, proportional to refractive indices. So that's what we get out here, and we're going to compare for the two, so it's not wavelength dependent. Uh, in order to only measure the cells themselves and not background noise you might get from either system, we draw a mask around the cells. Um, a lot of this is done by hand, but Art has worked a little bit on, on automated segmentation techniques to speed this up. We can put a mask over the cells. Um, set everything outside of them to zero to kind of remove background and make sure we're not counting that when we're computing volumes. Uh, and both of these techniques are going to be unique only up to an additive phase. We're measuring changes in phase, not absolute phase. So we have to set the zero point the same in both of them, and we just choose the average value over the boundary of the mask is zero in both cases, set the same reference point. Delta N is refractive index in the cell minus refractive index of what it's sitting in. So it tells you about uh, essentially the phase velocity difference of light in the cell versus the water or what water with, with growth medium. Yes. We are assuming, we're not, not assuming anything. We're assuming that both of these could vary and we're going to measure optical path length. Um, Yes, and N could vary. Uh, it doesn't vary too much, but it could. Um, so we may not, what we get out may not be exactly proportional to thickness. It will be relatively close, but it will entangle thickness with refractive index. Yes. Oh, this is not a, this is not a physical mass. This is a computational mass. <laughs> we would, we would if we put a real mass there. Uh, us computational people don't don't always uh, distinguish between them. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, these are the retrieved phases. The background has been zeroed out, and we can just sum over all the pixels to get total optical volume, we call it. It's summing the optical thickness. Uh, it's just a zero. It's just we don't want to count the background. So we draw something that's one over all the cells, zero on the background, and multiply it with this. It's just a way of zeroing out the background by outlining the cells to begin with. Um, so we looked at uh, different mechanisms of cell death. We looked at necrosis first, dosing cells with hydrogen peroxide enough to just blow them up and look for the volume changes there just to see that both systems produce the same results. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
we don't go from a big enough angle that we're going to worry too much about that here. Um, I'll, I'll very briefly have a slide on diffraction tomography, which is what Shane's looking at now, which is where you do have to start worrying about stuff like this. Um, but we're we're not really building into our models here. Yes, yes, yes. There's one main z-axis, and even though we're tilting, still the main z-axis, yes. Um, so these are the two techniques. You can see DHM has a little more graininess to it, some of which may be real, some of which may be that high-frequency uh, speckle noise, a uh, coherent noise. And TIE has much more slowly varying shapes in it, which is its kind of tendency to favor things that are smooth in the reconstructions and amplify them. But the two produce very similar results for optical volume. Uh, if you're paying attention, this is not optical volume. This is normalized optical volume. The reason for that is regularization. So what, what Shane found when going through and doing this was that if he picked different regularization parameters to remove this blobby background noise, the cells still looked pretty good in all the cases. But if he actually did an optical volume reconstruction, the thickness of these guys was dropping as we regularized more and more. We were removing information about them by regularizing. So that seems a problem. If you want to get optical volume, it depends strongly on your regularization parameter. Um, but we were worried about trends in optical volume over time. How are things changing? If we normalize the optical volume to the mean over each time series at any value of the regularization parameter, so this is low regularization up to high, we get very similar results for both. So one of our findings was, it, yeah, if you want absolute uh, optical thickness of something, you want to be very careful and not regularize too strongly when you're doing this. But if you want trends, we're actually very robust to regularization, which is good news for TIE because you don't want your technique to depend on trying to fine tune this one particular user defined parameter in the system. Uh, we then applied this to methamphetamine uh, induced apoptosis. So they went through a lot of work that I'm not going to go into um, on, on figuring out the dose that would induce apoptosis without just causing the cells to explode. Um, these are cells undergoing apoptosis in two time trials here, TIE at the top, DHM down here. These are comparisons of the relative optical volume, TIE in black, DHM in red, and they both show an increase over time in optical volume. And if we just look at the area of these guys and count up how big they are in cross-sectional area, they're all shrinking over time, which you can see from the movies, and that's in these plots. Um, so this was unexpected. They're shrinking, and yet we're measuring a volume, optical volume increase. So we went to the literature, and it turns out that as cells shrink, um, you expect the refractive index to depend on the concentration of proteins and solids inside of them. If it's an osmosis-induced shrinkage, it's just water coming out of them. The solid concentration increases, the refractive index goes up, and that goes up in the exact way to keep the total optical thickness constant. Um, and so the literature at least predicts that if osmosis is driving this, we should get a constant value rather than a decrease as they shrink. But we're still seeing an increase. So we went one step further and we started looking at a diffraction tomography. So this is a, a commercial device uh, that Alex has in his lab um, that, that we've applied to these cells with the refractive index increases. You can see as, as time goes on, this is one slice. It does a 3D reconstruction through the cells. Come back to, to what you were asking. This illuminates from many different angles, does a phase reconstruction from each, each angle and applies tomography to get a 3D phase reconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We tried, th these guys tried, Shane, Shane can tell you how many trials he did with different concentrations. The, the literature has a wide range of concentrations that seem to work and a wide range of different cells people have used this on. Um, we kind of started from the literature and, and these guys tried many different concentrations until they found one where they could confirm apoptosis by staining the cells. So it was a very, a summer of very painstaking measurements to find out what the right dosage to induce this was. This was by trial and error. They've actually looked. I'm not going to show all of the, the results. They, they have results for different doses, which may cause it faster, or may just kill the cells, or may do nothing, and then the cells just overgrow the plate, and we can't get anything useful out of it. Um, Shane has had, had many slides on that in his talk, so I'm not going to replicate it here. 
Um, but he can tell you there were there were months and months of work behind that one slide finding pretty pictures there. Um, so the end result of doing this tomographic reconstruction is that we see the refractive index distribution over volume. We can count up the total optical volume by summing every voxel of the refractive index through the cell. And we see an increase in this, this system by looking at one, one cell here. Um, at the same time, we see a decrease in the actual physical volume just by summing up the cells that we deemed cell material, uh, or, the, or the voxels we deemed cell material. And if we just project this down onto the, the, the plane of the screen here and count up how big is the cell in area, we see a drop in area. So at least the area drop and the growth in refractive uh, total optical volume, rather, for a single cell done tomographically matches what we were seeing in both systems in agreement for our optical measurements. We still don't fully understand this. There doesn't seem to be much in the literature reporting why this happens. It may, my guess would be there's some chemical changes going on in the cell that's actually changing the refractive index. It's not just as osmosis induced transport changes in volume, um, but, but we don't know at this point. We're still uh, studying it. So uh, I, I may wrap up there. I may show a couple of pretty pictures. I'll, I'll let you tell me when the cutoff is. I've gotten a lot of questions so far. Um, but to, to summarize at least the, the microscope part of things, um, the future directions are that, that we're looking at better models to include the microscope optics aberrations and stuff. Shane's working on that now, as well as uh, using our different angles of illumination to do tomographic reconstructions of things. Um, our our uh, funding here and the collaborators on this, this wouldn't be possible without Alex's lab um, and their expertise in, in the uh, digital holographic microscopy side of things and, and the cell growth. Um, and, and Anna and a, a biological collaborator on this, uh, Supriya, and all the students who have been involved in designing this system. So I'm behind because of all the questions I've gotten, but, but all right, I'll continue on and I'll try to be relatively quick. Um, the second thing we do is X-ray phase imaging. So X-ray phase imaging, again, Vivek, to come back to your question, what we're trying to get out is subtly different than what we're trying to get out with visible light. So in X-ray imaging, we're primarily interested in imaging low density materials. And when X-rays pass through, through a material, um, they're going to in interact with it through its refractive index, which you can characterize by a real part and an imaginary part. As you pass through, there's an absorption, which is governed by Beer's law. You have an exponential decay in intensity as you go in the Z direction through the material. You also accrue a phase. Turns out it's an advance for X-rays because the phase velocity is, is faster in matter than uh, in air for x-rays. Um, so you get a phase change, you get an attenuation, both are proportional to the thickness. The attenuation is not negligible as it was for the microscope. Um, yeah, oh, okay. So, so why do this? And the reason is these do two, two things do kind of tell you the same information, the electron projected electron densities you go through something, but beta is much smaller. The attenuation parameter is much smaller than the parameter that governs the phase advance you get. So when you're trying to image through soft tissue, you may get very, very weak differences in intensity uh, if you're trying to image conventionally with attenuation. And the hope is this thousandfold boost can get you much better ability to discriminate, same information, but better ability to discriminate higher contrast um, by using phase. So because it's a computational technique, you have to go through the whole computation and you can't just rely on the parameter itself. So when you solve the inverse models, if everything is ideal, meaning your source is like a, an X-ray laser, perfectly coherent, your detectors are perfect, no noise, um, your samples are absolutely pure, single material, perfect samples, you can do about 100-fold larger in SNR in conventional 2D X-ray images or 10,000-fold uh, better in CT. In reality, you do substantially worse than that, but that's the hope. There's, a, there's a, uh, an ability to boost your contrast. In addition, we capture one additional channel of information with, that we don't with visible light. If this has a grain structure, such as a powder structure inside of it, and this is a, on the micro scale, the micron to hundreds of nanometer scale in size, you can't see it at your detector. The X-ray coming in actually does scatter in a small angle off of that. And it turns out the system we've developed captures that as well. So we get grain structure information. Um, so I'll skip, well, I'll go very quickly through this. So our, our targets are to take something, this is the security application of the system we might uh, that, that we use. These are powdered explosive simulants. If you put them in luggage, the attenuation image is very low contrast, except for whatever electronics you have in here, um, because they don't absorb very much different from whatever background materials in, in there. 
The phase shows up a bit more, um, but that small angle scatter, because these are powdered explosive simulates, really highlights them against the background. So these additional channels of information have security applications. They have medical applications where we're primarily working on uh, breast cancer uh, imaging, mammography. So this is a uh, conventional mammogram over here, a phase contrast mammogram um, from the literature. And this is showing, I as a physicist can't tell you why this is better, but there's more contrast here and the radiologist can, can grade these things. And, and in the papers here, you can find studies of radiologists where they do the statistics and they, they get more information out of the higher contrast here. Um, I can tell you that this one looks better. This is an excised uh, uh, specimen with a tumor here. And this was imaged uh, in CT. So this is not a clinically applicable system that you go in and get a mammogram, but it's just showing you that if you get phase information, you can really see the tumor structure here that you're not getting an absorption information. So there is definitely more information there. Um, other applications, I'll go through very quickly. Chest x-rays to determine lung damage popular after, after COVID-19. Um, the scattering in your lungs shows up as, as the small angle scatter and a decrease in that tells you there's lung damage. There's studies of arthritis where the soft tissue, the cartilage can be imaged with uh, the, the phase contrast techniques, kidney stone classification with the scattering of a different uh, types of structures, small animal imaging to enhance contrast. This was just a, a mouse model for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and a lot of material studies, non-destructive material studies to study how, how materials are formed. And there are a lot recently on crack propagation in materials because the cracks show up in phase contrast very well. And again, this is just, I did a literature review on recent publications in the field um, and came up with these. So there's lots of, lots of work out there in this. Um, see, uh, TIE based imaging, can you do it with x-rays? Uh, yes, kind of. If you go down the axis from a sample you pass through, just like TIE says, the, the rays are deflected. You pick up a bright fringe around the edge of things from the deflection of the x-rays. The uh, problem with, with X-ray imaging and doing this is these angles are very small because of the small wavelength of X-rays, meaning you have to go a big difference to see changes in intensity. If you want to do the two-plane measurement scheme we're doing with our microscope, you have to go an additional significant fraction of a meter, something on the order of a half meter to a meter further on. Um, and in laboratory settings where you don't have a parallel beam like this coming in, you're expanding as you go. So you have two different magnifications. You're trying to subtract these two images to estimate the derivative. You've got to demagnify them to within a pixel of each other, ensure that you didn't shift by more than a, a 10 to 20 micron pixel as you went down the axis. So it's practically impossible. And there's, there's no one I've really seen who's been able to, to pull this off to do the two-shot method. So TIA-based methods, we have looked at this in the past. You can make various approximations on uh, limiting what this material is made of or limiting the contrast mechanisms to constrain your models and do a single shot. We don't do that anymore because it doesn't produce great results. The, the approximations are a little too limiting. Um, the, this technique is the grading-based technique, which is popular these days. It produces beautiful images like this. It uses a phase grading to produce a Talbot pattern. Um, for those of you who haven't studied much optics, if you put a periodic uh, phase object in the way of a beam and you go a substantial distance further than that, a certain distance, you get an amplitude pattern that's periodic with the period of the phase grading. And so they use that to generate a pattern on the camera. With a sample in place, it will deflect the rays and the pattern will shift. It turns out to do this in a reasonable distance, you have to have a very fine pitch phase grading when you're dealing with X-ray wavelengths. So they're dealing with tens of, of microns pitch in the gratings here. The camera can't really see the thing. Uh, the pattern that appears here has put another grating in front of the camera and translate it and take multiple images. And from the, the moiré pattern between the two, you infer what the shift was at the camera. Um, and you could do these with tabletop sources, but you have to also have a very small source. So they chop up the source with yet another grading mashed to these guys. The, it produces beautiful images, and this came from one of these systems. But it's uh, the problem with this technique is that the gratings are very fine pitched. They're expensive to manufacture. It's hard to manufacture them in large size. So you limit your field of view. You have to take multiple images, you shift this thing, increasing the dose or the time, depending on what's your limiting factor. Um, uh, so it may not be necessarily easily something you can roll out to the clinic. Yeah. You can have some spread in this. They've, they've demonstrated that. There are some impacts of, of using a monochromatic beam and, and beam hardening because where these fringes appear depend on the wavelengths involved, but they have demonstrated you can. 
Um, our system is much, much more robust than that. Uh, we put a very coarse pattern in. It's just a stainless steel mesh with a uh, hundred ish to 150 to 200 micron period of the mesh. This is directly resolvable over about 10 detector pixels. So we don't have to have an interference pattern. We don't have to have another grading here that we shift across it to figure out where these are, but it works on the same principle. There's a pattern. We determine where these fall without the object in place. The deflection subtly shifts them. And that small angle scatter means that the edges of these lines are no longer easily as easily visible as they were without the object in place. So we determine phase or ray deflection and get phase from the, the shift in these lines. And the blurring of the lines tells us about the small angle scatter, which tells us about the powder structure of what we're looking for. Um, the benefits are we can get away with a bigger source because it doesn't blur these out as quickly as with the finer pattern I showed previously. Um, but it does have lower resolution because this is a coarser pattern. We're limited by the, the size of the pattern here. And in, in turn, that means we're less sensitive to very small changes in phase. So we lose some of that. But we end up with a much more practical and easily implementable system from this. I will skip over all this. That is just to prove you can derive it all from TIE. Um, and our processing looks something like this. We have a mesh. We have, if you Fourier transform that mesh, you get different harmonics in Fourier space based on the period of the mesh. We look at the mesh image by itself, the mesh image with the object in place. If we take the data from the zeroth order harmonic and compare with and without the object in place, we can infer what the attenuation was to the object or the absorption image here. These are three vials, left one filled with pure water, middle one filled with diamond powder of very fine grain, zero to five mi 0.5 microns diameter, and the right one filled with a much coarser grain. Um, and the dark field image here of scatter, you can see the powders light up, with, which is what it's supposed to do, and the water you can't see at all. And this is differential phase contrast or phase derivative, which is the thing we directly get out of the equation without trying to integrate it. Um, and it's a horizontal derivative of the phase across the three vials. Um, these are some recent results from, from Arts uh, uh, and Wadia's recent work on the X-ray phase imaging system we're setting up. This is a, a breast tissue specimen from Ellis Hospital. Um, the absorption image, the two phase derivative, vertical, horizontal, and the two dark field channels coming out of it. And this is a phantom, just a test object we made with a bunch of PMMA sphere, plastic spheres, rods, and vials of different materials. And this vial up here is filled with a diamond powder. And you can see the phase derivatives, the absorption, and the two dark fields coming out of it down here. If we actually want to get phase out, we have phase derivative coming out of our system, vertical, horizontal. You can integrate them. So you, you integrate them, and you get a, a, an image which tells you about the projected electron density through this hopefully with higher contrast than the absorption image. And this is something that Wadi is currently working on, uh, trying to characterize our, our contrast to, to, uh, and seeing how it improves or does not improve at different energies and, and different system parameters. Um, the last thing, and the last couple of slides, I just wanna talk about the CT direction we're going in, which is the, the uh, most recent uh, system we set up. The idea of CT is if you want a 3D reconstruction of your, your patient or specimen you're looking at, you can rotate your source and detectors on a gantry around them and capture a bunch of images. And then again, it's a computational imaging thing. You come up with models and you form a 3D reconstruction through the patient. This is a single image of, of a chest X-ray and then one slice through this of a 3D reconstruction by CT. So it avoids a lot of overlap problems and, and clutter in your image and you can see individual things in the volume. We in the lab uh, don't want to come up with a gantry-based system to try to rotate it around our enclosures in the lab. So you can get the exact same modeling, uh, just smaller samples, uh, if you put the sample on a rotation stage and rotate it instead of your system. So that's what we do. So this is a vial setup. These are vials filled with water, an empty one in the back, and two different grain, the fine and the coarse grain diamond powders I showed before. And this is one slice through the CT reconstruction. This is the attenuation or absorption image. You can see everything show up, including the vial outside itself of the empty vial. But if we look at the dark field or scatter, we really only see the powders pop out there, which is again, what we expect. So if you wanna boost the contrast of powders, you could use this system to pretty clearly do that. Um, we also have been doing phase reconstructions. This is, we have much more recent stuff, which I think Art will be presenting uh, in the upcoming months. This is from back in the spring. Um, we took a CT reconstruction of a fish. This is just slicing vertically down through the fish. This is the integrated phase we get out. Um, and this is just the comparison on the left of the attenuation channel coming out of our system versus the phase channel. Um, and again, you can look at this. Looks like there's more noise here. Is there more contrast, bright to dark? 
it's hard to say. And this is one of the things that Wadi is currently looking at uh, over a variety of system parameters and samples to see where, where we actually beat the attenuation in, in a real world system. Um, so the future work for this, uh, we're trying to boost the contrast to noise or signal to noise ratio analysis or in our reconstructions, looking at looking at when we beat the attenuation, optimizing our system for CT. Uh, we I didn't discuss any of the x-ray optics we've used variously in these systems. So we're trying to uh, implement those in these systems to see if we can focus down to smaller spots to have more coherent illumination, improve our signal. Um, and the people who have helped with this, uh, Carolyn McDonald, um, in the Center for X-ray Optics, all of the current students who are working on this um, and, and recent students whose, whose works went into this. And then our funding is from, from New York State Department of Health um, to initially develop this system. So I will wrap up only 10 minutes over time. So that's usually in in a coherent diffraction, right? So so you're trying to determine the crystal structure of what you're imaging. Yes, yes. So You're all the way in the the far field of it. So you're 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 picking up your Fourier transforming and then taking the modulus square of the field. So there is a lot of work on that, and that can fall into this whole computational imaging framework. Your model is now Fourier transform and modulus square rather than short propagation distance and modulus square. So it's kind of the opposite regime, which also is easier to solve than it turns out intermediate distances. But we, we we don't do any of that. You'd have to go really far distances and we're diverging and we'd have no photons by the time we got there. Yeah, we, we so we when we were looking at this, we got interested because people were publishing papers using the grading systems on trying to determine powder uh, structure. And from what I recall, I just looked up, went to Amazon and looked up powders of this size. And people sell diamond powder just for polishing things, like polishing optics and polishing other things. You, you make a paste with it. But they're, they're pretty cheap. It's like 10 bucks for a little packet of it. And you can put it in a vial and make your phantoms. Yeah. People have have done like uh, polystyrene spheres. If you go to the literature, uh, they'll order them from catalogs too of very defined sizes for this. Yeah. So I want the computer to be able to solve the problem better faster. And have you considered like trying one of the like the publicly available, but not exactly some of the kind of I have not considered it, but could they handle 20 megapixel images? Yeah, that's that 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 would be my sense. I I haven't seen much. I didn't discuss uh, deep learning is obviously really big here as it is everywhere else these days. And that's something we're getting interested in. There is definitely an application for deep learning in using that as a method of either learning the mapping from one domain to another and skipping the whole optimization or using its optimization frameworks, which are very well developed to optimize these problems. But I, I have never seen, I think it's probably just you don't have enough bandwidth in these quantum computers to handle the, the data in one of these big images. Even in deep learning, that's a problem. 20 megapixel image being fed into these deep neural networks takes a huge amount of memory. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, the, the few ideas that 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 I've been pitching to students. No, 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 no. The 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 thing we're looking at now is you can rather than trying gradient descent, you can have a neural network whose parameters. Uh, produce the phase from your measured intensity, and you can optimize those parameters directly instead of trying to gradient descent on the phase directly. And there's a lot of early work that shows that that tends to work really well. Um, that's kind of the most interesting thing to me, rather than just training it to to learn how to reproduce fishes, and then you put a patient in the scanner and they look like a fish, uh, which is the problem with with what people have been traditionally doing for deep learning with it. <laughs> 